Hey guys, we want to welcome you back to the FPC Okeechobee podcast, our video edition. However you're finding us, uh, we're glad that you're here to be a part of our conversation. And we're going to continue today in uh, Mark chapter 1. And we're going to pick up in verse 7, continuing talking about John. Listen to what verse 7 has to say, Marie. He says, And he was preaching and saying, After me, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is so interesting to me because this now brings in the idea kind of, the for the first time, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that you're going to find all throughout the New Testament taught about by Paul and all the other gospel writers and James and Peter and John, all of those. And it actually goes back um, to the Old Testament when there we talked about the Spirit would be poured out. Right. So this is it. This is that moment. And there's a huge difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. And John's whole deal was he was a forerunner of Christ, right? Mm-hmm. So his baptism was exactly the same. It was a forerunner. We baptize, but our... Our baptism in Baptist churches, in any church that baptizes, especially by immersion, it means something different because repentance has already happened. John's is all about repentance, and baptism for Christians represents that new birth, that new life that's taking place. So John's baptism demonstrated repentance, but it didn't really cleanse from sin. It was very symbolic for those Jews that were coming in and having this baptism and striving to repent. It was almost more of a, they're acknowledging their sin right. because it really, really deal with their sin long term. But Christ's baptism... And we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that that He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's permanent. That never stops. You know, that's that's continual. But you're not trying to say, though, that baptism today is linked with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No. (laughs) Because there are some people that... Think that and yes, yes. believe that. and That idea of what a lot of people would call a second blessing is what I've I heard guess. it referred to as. I don't know all the terms that go with it. But. Or that idea the, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate from your salvation or something like that. And people even get into tongues. Yeah, it, it, it can be very confusing and uh, there's a lot of different beliefs and... Things that go along with that. Yeah, what what I see in Scripture, you know, pretty much all throughout, is when you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's that's what's happening there, and you have true repentance, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven, past, present, future, for all time. Your eternal home in heaven is secured, and at that time, you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people will try to separate that out to some extent. Some people even go as far as to say that if you have not spoken in tongues, you're not really a Christian. Now, boy, that is way down the road. I, I, I do have a problem with that theology. I, I do not agree with that even slightly. I don't even separate that salvation from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, from, from that baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think those are simultaneous things that are happening you know, together that when we come to know Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit at that same time. And then that's the, the Holy Spirit. He's our link in that relationship with the Father and the Son, I think is how you know it, it, it is and should be taught. I mean, I believe that mostly because that was my experience. I mean, I um, didn't know all of these passages and understand all of the different um, ideas about uh, what could happen with the Holy Spirit and all of that. I was younger and I didn't know all of those things, all the different um, denominations and what they believed. And I distinctly remember 
falling on my knees and asking God to forgive me for my sins. And I literally felt the Holy Spirit come inside of me. And it's not something that I talk about a lot, but I distinctly remember it. I will never forget. And I know that that is the moment that God forgave me of my sins. And I, I became part of his kingdom. There's so many different ways that you can describe that, but I became a Christian that day because I distinctly remember that God um, blessed me in that way. And that was way before I was baptized um, or knew any of the things uh, that we're talking about today. So I feel like they're distinct, um, mostly because of my experience. Baptism for Christians today really is a public way of professing your relationship with Christ. It's a public way of saying that you've been forgiven, you're changed, that idea of being born again, that you're Which a, that is you're the a same new creation. Thing that they were doing in these verses, right? It was a public way of It was a public way of repenting, repenting for sin, and yeah. turning around yeah. from the life that they had been living. But it wasn't it wasn't eternal in nature. Like, Did they think that it was? No, I don't believe. No, they didn't. So no. I feel like they're very similar to what we believe. There are some as some similarities. Baptism today. But the baptism John was baptizing was just basically them saying, we want to be cleansed from our sins and we know we've done wrong and we want to repent. Jesus' baptism that we talk about today as he took that idea of baptism, just as you know, the Lord's Supper, it's the Passover meal. Mm -hmm. Jesus repurposed that in under the new covenant. It's more of a sign of not just repentance, but that we've been forgiven, we've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven, and we're now a new creation. You know, some people even say, say phrases when they baptize people like, you know, buried, buried in death with Christ, raised right. to walk with Him in new life. I've heard people you know, say things like that as they baptize. I'm more simple, I'm just, I baptize you in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, down and up you go. But some people will even have different phrases and things they'll say to represent that. Nothing wrong with that. I think that's very appropriate. You know, you, you know, kind of however you feel feel led to do that. So they are connected in some way, but Jesus' baptism added some extra representation onto it that John's really didn't have because John was the Messiah. John wasn't saving people. You know, Christ brings that literal salvation. Now, look at verse nine. It says, "One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee." And John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Okay, a couple things happening here. Number one, we know from all the Gospels that John did not feel worthy to baptize Christ. Right. That becomes, you know, really clear in Matthew chapter three. Uh, he he resists this, like over like verse fourteen, verse fifteen. Did he verse know 16. that Jesus was going to come to him for baptism? Yes, I believe so. Um, I think that God showed him that. Uh, and as I look through Scripture, and I think we talked about this a little bit last last time. John was expecting Christ, and he knew that whoever he baptized, that the Holy Spirit would descend on him like a dove, and that would be the Messiah. Yeah, we did talk about that last week, and we've discussed it a little bit since then. So that's true, because if he was expecting that sign from God, then he would have expected um, at least that the Messiah, and if he expected that Christ or that Jesus was the Messiah, then he would have expected him. Yes, and he remember they knew each other. Right. You know, this wasn't the first time they met. They were cousins. We don't know how much interaction they had as kids. We know Mary went to visit John's mother Elizabeth while um, Elizabeth was pregnant with John, and so there's a, a some level of a decently deep family connection there. Uh, he also, I believe, already knew Jesus was the Messiah before he baptized him. Because John even tells him, it's over in Matthew chapter 3, he says, you should baptize me. I shouldn't be baptizing you. And then Jesus tells him, says, no, no, this is how it's supposed to be. And so John agrees, John baptizes him, and that's when the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Now in John, though, because this is what we talked about last week when I said I wasn't sure I could have been making it up, but I went back and looked, and it is in John where it says that 
um, basically I, I didn't know you, um, but this sign from God tells me that you're the one who will bring the Holy Spirit. So yes. um, why does it say that? It says in, um, says in verse, this is John chapter 1, it's verse 29. It says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So obviously right there in verse 29, he, he knows. This is before he baptizes him. He says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Mm -hmm. So John is even giving testament there to the fact that Christ is, is God. He was before me. John's older than him. John was born before him, but yet he says he was before me. So he's understanding Jesus' pre-incarnate, holy, um, eternal form. And he says, verse 31, I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptized with water that he might be revealed to Israel. See, I think John may have already known, but him baptizing him, Holy Spirit descending, this is announcing it to the entire nation of Israel. So John's that forerunner, and his baptism, which served a great purpose, he was calling the nation of Israel to repentance, to stop just being religious, and to repent. And then here he is as the man that's going to help reveal him to the entire nation. And I think it's confirmation. When John does baptize him and the dove descends, I think that's 100% confirmation for John in that moment. Do you think that he might have even told other people that that was the sign before and John? the crowd could have been maybe aware of that even? I don't know. I, that, that's a good question. I, because I, there would have been a crowd, right? Oh, John drew big crowds. There was definitely a crowd there the day Jesus came and was baptized. And everybody would have been absolutely stunned by what they saw. I mean, they would have been blown away. Well, but, to hear the voice of God. And yeah, and you know, here, <laughs> amazing, yeah. here, here's God, you know, speaking in this moment. Right. So the, the Father speaking to and about the Son. So, you know, that would have been amazing. So I think Jesus' baptism was John's ultimate confirmation, but I think he already knew, and it was kind of like, yeah, this is it. You know, it's kind of like you already know something's, gonna, something's happening, you already know somebody is, but then the truth kind of really rolls out. They confess it to you, or you see it in action, and right. it kind of just confirms everything for you. I think is really how it, you know, how it flowed together really well. Now, there are verses in the Old Testament that talk about the Holy Spirit. Yes, right? Lots. Because there are, I always go, I always am fascinated by what um, Jews believe because they have the beginnings mm -hmm. of uh, the same things that we look at and the same things we see, but they see something different and they don't recognize the Holy Spirit, do they? Yes, uh, they, they, they do. They talk about the Spirit of the Lord. Okay. Um, like you go back to... You go back and there's multiple cases. Saul, the, mm -hmm. the Bible talks about um, the first king. Separate him from like Saul that we talk about. Saul that became Paul. talking about Saul like the first king of Israel before David. The Bible talks about that, that he, um, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon Samson. And it says that specifically, and he would have great strength. So the Spirit of the Lord is talked about. It talks about in Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit so, of the Lord moved upon the face of the water. They believe it. God in two persons? No, I would... I would. Do you get I'm, what I'm saying? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like they don't think that we're correct and you know, we say that God is in three Yes, forms, three and one. You know, yeah. and um, I don't know. I thought that they thought um, that was blasphemy because God is one. Um, I don't know. But I don't know exactly. And that's a good one. Something we'll study for, for next time. I like when we talk about things and come up with them. How do they necessarily view those verses that say the Spirit of the Lord? Do they separate that out from the Father, or do they just see this as another form of the Father? That's a good question for like what an Orthodox Jew would believe. Because as we read Scripture, I'm always reading it through the lens of the Old Testament and New Testament. So when I see that Spirit of the Lord, I'm automatically connecting that with the Holy Spirit right, as it's put talked our about. Expectations yeah, on as that. the Holy Spirit as He's talked about in Acts. You know, when you have the when you have Pentecost and, and those kind of things. So I automatically understand this. I would say the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the, Which the face of the water. They do I, too. I but for example, when we see um, references in the Old Testament for Christ, they see, and we believe that's Jesus, 
they see it as the Messiah who is to come mm -hmm. and reign here on earth, just like they did um, when Jesus first came, and they yeah. thought he would yeah. be king. Yeah, they miss the they miss the suffering servant. Right. Like the the Jews are just looking for the conquering king. They're not in, they're not interested in the suffering servant. And the Old Testament really has both. And it's easy to skip one of those. And I've said it a little bit about how they view Christ in the Old Testament, but I haven't really looked at how they see the Holy Spirit and what they believe about God in His forms. Um, yeah, I can't say I've ever studied that. So. That specifically from a how the Jewish people would see that. I've studied it in a great, great length about how Christians would view and see the Holy Spirit within the Old Testament. And He's very active and very visible, just as Christ is. You know, if you've been listening to any of the many messages, Christ is all over the book of Genesis. I mean, we were just working through this week, um, videoing for um, Genesis chapter 17 and 18, and He's everywhere. He's, he's, all over the, he's all over those two chapters. I mean, him and, him and Abraham are sitting around having a conversation, eating lunch together. I mean, it is... Like we're talking about kill the fat and calf, bring some milk and some butter, and let's sit down and have lunch. And I look at that, and I'm, I'm thinking, how can you not know this is God? Um, well, the way Abraham responds to him very much shows that it's God. Right, and we talked about this in another episode um, before we started filming. But, um, yeah, definitely they at the time believed that that was God. But then over time and through tradition, they began to, mis to see the Messiah differently. Um, mm -hmm. But... I know I keep bringing that up, but it's just fascinating to me. Oh, no, I know you've always been kind of interested in how the Jewish people view right. the Old Testament and how they may see it through a different lens than Christians do because, as I said, we're taking the Old Testament, New Testament, looking at them in, looking at them in harmony, and they're just taking the Old Testament and pushing the New Testament aside and saying, no, none of that's, none of that's legitimate. You know, and that's, that's the great failing for them is they miss the Messiah. You know, right. I mean, honestly, that's as I, as I view it. Now, it doesn't take away their promises. You know, they're still God's chosen people. The promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still apply. The land, the number of the descendants like stars in the sky, sand on the seashore, those things are still in effect. God's covenant that He makes is everlasting. But can you imagine the blessing of having all of those promises and accepting Christ for who He is? Yeah, and there, um, there, and are, there, are, are, there are a lot of do, Jew, just, Jewish people, people of Jewish descent that... Right have embraced Christ as the Messiah, and I think and, which is awesome. that's amazing and just uh, a blessing. And, yeah, you um, want to talk about having, having, the, <laughs> know, right? having the full boat there, man. <laughs> right. he, got, he got it all. You yeah. know, They were God's chosen people to carry His message and to bring the Messiah. That's what it talks about in Genesis chapter 12. The nations were blessed. The world was blessed by Abraham. How were they blessed by Abraham? Because Christ came through Abraham. That's how He was a blessing to all the nations. You know, It talks about His descendants will be kings. Yeah, sure will. Like mm -hmm. the king of kings, like the king of all the kings. Everybody will bow before him. That's Abraham's direct descendant from the human, the human side, the incarnation of Christ. That's his direct descendant. You can trace it all the way back. Go to Matthew and look at that genealogy and you'll run all the way back to Abraham. I just love that God is a storyteller and that, you know, it says in John that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. And... He is the ultimate storyteller. He uses words and he weaves these stories that are so beautiful. We can talk about them thousands of years later and just continue to just tap the surface of what he's doing and how he's uh, writing our stories and weaving them together and just, um, yeah, doing something that's amazing. I think. And so I love that part of the Bible. I love the narratives. Mm -hmm. The narratives are my favorite part. Like Genesis is one of my favorite books of the Bible because I love the story of those patriarchs. I love the Gospels with the narrative. I love Acts with the narrative. You know, I appreciate all the epistles. I study them. James is, James is another book that I really, really love in the Bible that I've gravitated towards over the years just on a personal level. But I love the narratives, like the story of David, the story of Samuel, the, the all those things you learn in, in Judges, Joshua's story. I, I love all of it. I love all that so much. It's part of the history buff in me. But I just love those narratives and what we can pick out of it and see God moving. I've really enjoyed teaching through Genesis. Again, this is like, gosh, I've taught through Genesis over the course of years multiple times, and I get something new out of it every time mm -hmm. as I look through it. Okay, let's, let's jump back. We, we chased some rabbits. I liked it. 
Okay, verse 9, um, it, it talks about this baptism. He baptized Jordan River, and he, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. So here is the great question, and this is something I think I want to talk about for a minute. We can kind of wrap up after this. Why did Jesus need to be baptized to begin with? I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I feel like everything that he did was symbolic and for us to see and understand and replicate. You know? I think that was a part of it. I think it was a part of it. If you talk about John's, when you talk about John's baptism, it was all about repentance, right? Mm -hmm. What did Jesus need to repent of? He was sinless, right? Here's the sinless... God the Son, that's how, that's how He could be our sacrifice. What was He repenting of? I think sometimes we shortchange what repentance really means. This was part of kind of Jesus' unveiling in His public ministry. I mean, this was an announcement publicly. We think about the wedding at Canaan when He turned water into wine, His first miracle kind of has come out of public. This was even bigger. Mm -hmm. This was John, who was famous, okay? If, if John was in modern times, we take that forward, John would have been on the news. John would have been being talked about. People would have been on social media bashing John. I mean, it would have, <laughs> how dare yeah. you tell us to <clears throat> repent? I mean, you know, it would have, it, this weird guy wearing camel hair and eating locusts, who wants to listen to him? I mean, you know, Twitter would have been all of us. So here's a famous guy. And then Jesus comes, and John's like, you need to baptize me. That would have caught everybody's attention. I shouldn't tie the, 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 the straps of your sandals. Like, that's catching people's attention. And so then here's this announcement. So I definitely think there was an element of it was a public announcement. It was symbolic for us. But then if I expand on repentance just a little bit, we a lot of times think of repentance as just dealing with the things I shouldn't do, and turning away from them. But I think repentance has even a, a different meaning, a deeper meaning, in that it's not just about forgiveness. It's not just about stopping sin. It's about what we are going to do. Because repentance is a 180. It's turning mm -hmm. and going in a different direction and replacing and submitting yourself to the will of God and living your life as He's calling you to. So I think Jesus' repentance in this was more in the form of He was fully submitting Himself to the Father for what was to come and what His ministry was going to be. And that's an example to us in that, yeah, Jesus didn't need to repent of any sins, but Jesus in this was saying, not my will, but your will be done. This is the first time He's saying that. And He'll say it audibly in the garden right before He's crucified. Yeah, I like that perspective. I like that point because really the whole the whole point of salvation is to not just recognize that you're a sinner, but to ask forgiveness and make God the king of your life. Yes, and that's what was happening here. The father, the the son was submitting was submitting to the father and the father's will and saying, "I'm going to do it your way. Mm -hmm. This is how this is going to work." And so that carries over for Christians when we're making that public profession of faith through baptism. We're not just saying we're doing well with our sin. We're not just saying we're going repenting of that. We're saying our lives are going to change and go in a different direction, and we're going to live as the Father's called us to. And Christ is the ultimate example of that. He submitted. He was God, mm -hmm. and yet He emptied Himself of that. He didn't, he didn't empty himself of his sinlessness. He didn't empty himself of his divinity. He didn't empty himself of his eternal nature. But he did set aside some of that power and walk as a man. And here he is saying, I'm going to live as the Father calls me to. He was, he was living that for us and showing us how that was supposed to look. And he did that. He was obedient. The book of Philippians tells us he was obedient even unto death on the cross. He went all the way. Yeah. So when we Even, think about repentance, it's got a What I love, though, is that you can see in, um, in the garden how he struggles with it, and he knows it's not what his flesh mm -hmm. is wanting to Nobody endure. could be looking forward right. to that. So I, I do love that, and I love that it shows his humanity 
not with the sinfulness, but just the flesh. Yeah, because he was fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. He was both. He, he carried both, and that's how he was able to, to walk a mile in our shoes and be good enough as being sinless, but yet he was human to sacrifice himself for us. There was the, the, the combining of those things. And we'll dig into that, too, as we get on through this and talk about some of the that theology, the, yeah. the hypostatic union and some of those. Some of the, Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, some of those things. But uh, I've enjoyed our conversation again today. Yeah. All right. Well, guys, we want to thank you for joining us and being a part of the FBC Okeechobee podcast. Uh, we hope that you have a great day and be blessed where you're at. And we'll see you guys real soon. Okay.